By way of introduction, my name is Charles Parker Waipa Andrus. I came to Oahu in 1954 to a Haole father and a Hawaiian mother. My father's ancestry comes from Utah and he came here on a mission for the Mormon Church or Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints and then also did a mission in Japan after World War II where he met my mother. And my mother's family is originally from Mokuokeave, which is the big island and her family is comes from Parker Ranch. Her great-great-grandfather was John Palmer Parker who came here in the mid 1800s, mid to late 1800s and settled here and he was from Massachusetts. Did I pronounce that right? Anyways, he married Kipikane. Kipikane was the granddaughter or great-granddaughter of Kamehameha I and they were given an uh, acre of land to start out with and from that time forward um, that developed into the biggest privately owned ranch. I don't know if it was in the world, but that's where my bloodline comes from. And so my great grandfather, Robert Parker Waipaw, was recruited by one of the Kamehamehas, the younger ones, to come to the palace and be, uh, because of his uh, writing skills on, uh, on being a paniolo, a cowboy, and his shooting skills, he was recruited and he ended up being captain of Kalakaua's guard. There's a lot of political uncertainty. I don't know the whole story. I don't want to go into that political legal end of it, but he, he ended up coming here and he had 18 children with uh, Sarah Koa. And she was a Spencer, which was half white from the Big Island. And my grandpa was number 13 of 18. And he was a shipwright here, worked at Pearl Harbor as a shipwright and then a carpenter for the, for the church built a lot of the chapels until he passed away in 1965. And my mom was uh, born in 1923, and she's 98. She'll be 98, 99 this June, and she's still alive, so we're kind of taking care of her. And so we spent time in Japan, and we came back here. I was born here in Kahalu, or a Queen's Hospital, but we lived in my grandma's house in Kahalu on the water. And uh, we went to Japan for it's six and a half years and then returned home here in 1961 and lived in my grandma's house again and that was right on the water and when I got home I knew I was home and we loved being living on the water because we had everything we had crabs and fish and the ocean was right in front of us and we used to swim and go fishing and as I got older I got my interest more in like making skim boards piper boards and then we wanted to surf so we didn't have money back then, so we started stripping longboards, which was right around 1966, 67. I was 12 years old. And my first board, I stripped in the yard with Polly Mench, who was my, me my neighbor. And we shaped a, a, a McTavish V bottom, which was in vogue at that time. And I remember doing, it took us all day to a couple days, and we glassed it psychedelic colors and glassed it. And we thought it was really good, probably looked like crap, but we loved it and that's how we started and my neighbor across the street Kurt Mensch his father was a shipwright who actually took my took over my grandpa's job when my grandpa retired from Pearl Harbor so he had access to fiberglass and resin so that's how we started and so I started at uh, about 12 years old and made boards all through high school and that you know, I, I did work construction. I did do some carpentry. I was in the labor union and in the carpenters union, but I, I wanted to be a shaper. I did glass my own boards. I had all my own boards that I glassed, and, but I wanted to be a shaper. And so in, I was doing that continually surfing. And then in 1973, October, I went to Japan and served the mission for the, the church. And I was there for two years. And when I got home, I, I went to go see Ben Ipa again because when I was in high school, Ben Ipa was one of the few shapers that would give me any advice or do anything. And he, he took me under his arm and just showed me. The Hawaiian style is you just come in and you watch. If you want to learn how to play slack key guitar, you don't ask him about the threads. You just sit down and watch. So that's what Ben was a big help and he was a big inspiration for me. And very technical guy. I wasn't really like that, but he helped a lot in that. And when I came back, uh, from my mission prior to that to go back even further when I was in high school I we used to buy all our materials from this guy called Rich Parr on Queen Street 
It was Rich Parr Surfboards, and I thought I was getting pretty good, and he told me I wouldn't consider you a shaper unless you shaped at least a thousand boards, and it kind of broke my heart. But then, in retrospect, I can, I can understand what he was talking about. So when I came back in 1975, Harold Iggy was in his shop. Uh, Rich Parr had to leave for a lot of reasons. I don't want to go into that. But anyways, uh, Harold Iggy was in there, and he was really helped me a lot. And I was home, I was working construction, and then I was, I was engaged to be married, and I knew I had to get a job, so I went to go see Jim Hayes at Tropical Bands, Blends. I went to see Rob Burns, he had just started Locomotion. I went to see HIC, because I, I, I had bought a little place, I, I was paying a mortgage and all this so I needed, so HIC was the one that could give me the most work. So I started hand shaping at HIC back in 1978, and I was there for nine years, and I, I quit HIC and went to work for Rob Burns and was there for locomotion for like 20 years. And then I've been on my own for since, you know, another 15, 18 years, 20 years. I don't know, I can't keep track. So I've been doing it. And uh, in the meantime, we lived in Haula in Kahalu. We went to the big island and I'm back here. I have a shop at my friend's farm up in Waihole and that I'm still doing what I've been doing. Well, when we were growing up, you know, the guys that really inspired us were surfer shapers, not necessarily just shapers, you know, but, you know, back then in the media, you'd hear about Greg Knoll and David Nueva and all these kind of people, but I was more focused on local guys. And one guy I really focused on, even though he wasn't a shaper, was Jock Sutherland. He's such a good surfer. This is before anybody even heard about Jerry Lopez. And then Jerry Lopez came on the scene and he was definitely a shape, uh, surfer shaper. And so we all aspired, we want to be like him. We surf pipe. The problem with me is I'm a bigger person. He's probably 135 pounds dripping wet and I'm about 200 pounds or 195. And so we we're trying to ride pipe on the same boards that he rode. So I discovered I needed to make bigger boards. And so it was just a process of evolution. And um, guys like him, Diff actually, showed me a few things. He was a famous longboard shaper and he, and he mentored Buddy Dumphy. When I went to HIC, Buddy was doing longboards and I wasn't familiar with longboards, so Buddy actually showed me about longboards. And Stephen Ng was the, the main shaper at HIC and he showed me how to production shape. He would come in early in the morning and be out of there by one o'clock and shape five hand-shaped boards every day. And it just blew my mind. But he was a, a surfer shaper. He, me and Steven surfed some really big days at Pipeline and he kind of, he would always, and we never wore leashes back in the day and he was one of my mentors, you know. So Ben Ipa helped me in high school and then Steven Ng and then Buddy Dumphy and these are the shapers, local shapers that, that really helped me and, you know, I've been doing it ever since. Ever since, wow. Yeah. And uh, who are some of the uh, people you've shaped boards for? Well, way back in HIC, they had a bunch of pros they brought in, but the main guy I was working with was Hans Hiedemann. In fact, I was so stoked when he won the World Cup on my board. And um, that was just when I was transitioning out of HIC to locomotion. So ABC Wide Roller Sports came to interview us, and I was with my locomotion t-shirts, and he was with his HIC, all his stuff, you know, but it was a shaper, surfer interview, the relationship. So was Hans, there was guys from South, South Africa that I shaped. I can't really remember all their names. And at that time period, and then in lo and when I was shaping for Locomotion, I shaped for Titus Kinimaka, a lot of the Hawaiians from Kauai. Um, I think I did a few boards for Max maybe, and then I did, um, terrible, I can't remember his name. He'd be mad if he sees me or not. Anyways, a, a lot of local people, but mostly as, as time evolved, you know, instead of being a production shaper for stock boards, it ended up that I was just doing custom hand shapes because I've never got into the computer end of it. And I'm just grateful I'm doing something I enjoy doing. I don't really consider it work. It's just something I do, you know, and in Hawaiian you say Hanukalima is you work with your hands and I love doing that and I love surfing. So, you know, it's not really a job to me yeah. and I'm already old already but I'm still living living the dream you know I don't make a lot of money but I make sufficient and I I spend time I have nine grandchildren and three daughters I spend a lot of time with them you know with my son-in-laws and we we go surf and you know this is the Hawaiian life that I like
So let's um, I want to talk about your planer before. I forget. Can I go get it? Yeah, yeah. Before I forget, because I was like, whoa, you better get that. This is my skill planer that I've had since about 1971, and if you look at it. It has a Quicksilver sticker on it, one of the original Quicksilver stickers, and I took the, the plate off and put that on. But I got this planer from Terry Tevis. Terry Tevis used to take me surf a lot because he drove and I didn't. I didn't have a car, and you know, he, his mom had remarried someone that had uh, was very wealthy, and this is one of the, the things that he bought and he got into shape, and then he sold it to me. And this is my first planer that I've had. I've dropped it a couple times over the years. It's still good, but I have uh, several other other planers that I still use. And this, this to me is the ultimate tool for for hand shaping. Well, how I'm doing it nowadays is my friend Spencer Chun. He's a MD doctor, but surfer, and he surfed a lot with a good friend of mine, Samoan, who passed away. Probably one of the greatest Samoan surfers. Or I would say the greatest Samoan big wave surfers. He's on the Eddie Aikau uh, honorary list. His name is uh, Les Falatea, and Spencer was kind of mentored by him. So Spencer lives on Maui, and he went on his mission to Japan, married Japanese, and has three kids, and he surfs, but he's a doctor. He called me up uh, a couple years ago and said, Uncle Chuck, I want to do an Instagram for you. And I go, oh, what's Instagram? You know, I'm not into that. He goes, well, I'll manage it, and I'll do it. So he's been helping out, so I get a few orders from that. But mostly it's just word of mouth and repeat customers that I've been, you know, over the years. And their friends have friends of friends and friends, so it kind of slowly spirals down. You know, there's kind of a genealogy or lineage of how they got boards from who to who to who. So it's unbelievable. I don't believe that I've been shaping this long. It doesn't feel that long, you know, since 1978. I mean, kids can't even relate to that. It's like, wow. <laughs> Because remember, when I was born in 1954, the tallest building in Honolulu was the Aloha Tower. At that time, there was a law that said no buildings taller than a coconut tree. So that's when I came here. Things have changed drastically. Yeah, it has. Yeah, I think that's and that's why I love Tahiti so much. Tahiti's like here 100 years ago. It's the same feeling. It's the same people. It's the same language. Yes, they speak French like we speak English, but their language is, is, is my language. That's why I just love to be in Tahiti. <laughs> and I love being here. It's just hard, hard sometimes to see all the changes that aren't, you know, Tahiti hasn't really changed in the last 20, 27 years I've been going there. Very little change. Hawaii is a beautiful place and it's a special place. All of Polynesia is so beautiful it is. and it's so special. And the language, and I was, because I've gone to Tahiti all these years, because I speak Japanese going to Japan and being there as a child, and that's not my language, but I can still speak it. But because I spent a lot of time in Tahiti, I learned to speak Tahitian, which is just like Hawaiian. And because I learned Tahitian, the Hawaiian kind of came for free. And so it's quite liberating to be able to express yourself in a different language that feels close to you, you know. And I think that's why Big Bill connects so much with the Hawaiians and the Tahitians. You know, he spent a lot of time with Eddie Aikau, and he's very close to that family. And when he went to Tahiti, he just connected with them. And they treat him like Ali'i when he comes, because Big Bill is 6'8". He's a big man, oh, you know, 6'8". Wow. Six, six, and he was, one of, he was one of the few surfers, black surfers I remember. Buttons is half. Kaluyu Kalani is half. His father's black and the mother is like, three quarters Hawaiian, you know, so not too many of them. Shaped in Japan for 10 years for uh, uh, Hiromichi Soeda. Yeah, Wakita, you know Wakita, he surfs Pipeline. He's the, old, he's the OG out there. His son is doing real well now, but I shaped for him and a lot of the Japanese pros for many years. So the older Japanese guys know me, but a lot of the young kids don't know me. And how I met Jake Maki is I kept seeing pictures of him on these crazy waves at Himalaya. They go, who's this kid? And they go, yeah, he's ready. You're bored. You got it from Mikey Red. I go, really? Yeah, Mikey, yeah. Yeah, Mikey is Mikey's super cool too, man. Mikey is a pure Hawaiian trapped in a Haole body. <laughs> he is, he, he yeah, is like guy. so much aloha. Yeah, so he gave, or I don't know how, much, how Jake ended up with that board. So I kept seeing it. Then I heard he broke it. So through Spencer, the Instagram, I got a hold of him. And we had an appointment over here. And he, and he goes, oh. Uh, Uncle Chuck, I'll be here. I'll be here shortly. I go, he must be coming with his girlfriend. He came with his mom, yeah. 16 years old, skinny little kid. I go, holy crap. 
unreal but he's a nice kid and I yeah. told him you know like me all my friends growing up was that was the hippie time they all got into paka they all got into heroin and cocaine and all these drugs you know and I told him stay away a lot of the top guys are all into this opioids and stuff don't drink don't, you'll be a better man for it. I've never did I kind of rebelled against my friends and because I built a lot of their boards and I said you go ahead you try to trick me into drugs and I'll put your skeg on crooked I'll glass it terrible and you know, so I kind of, and I was just kind of a loan shark. I, I never really ran with a lot of people, and I've always been that way. So I'm still kind of doing I have a board I made in 1972 in this garage. You want to see it? Yeah, let's go ahead and, yeah. I'll grab it and bring it out here. Okay. okay, this is a board that I got back because of Daniel Jones. His wife found it at a garage sale. Uh, Dan Daniel Jones is Mikala Jones's brother. Anyways, he builds boards now too. And he called me up and goes, "Oh, Uncle Chuck, I, my wife found this at a garage sale for 20 bucks. You you wanna get you want it or something?" So I believe I'm not sure, but I think I gave him some Clark foam blanks that I had, and he gave me this. And I looked at it, and there's actually my name on the stringer in tiny pencil. But I remember building these boards in this garage. I was probably 10th or 11th grade at that time period just when things were transitioning and Ben Ipa used to do a foam stain for Keone Ho'opi it was it was the board was baby blue with a maroon swirl like this so that's where I kind of got the idea but this is kind of contemporary to what we were writing back then Ed Sirfoss taught, taught us how to make fins and we went down to uh, Bill Stonebreaker's place and watched them glass we went to uh, Rich Parr he helped us a lot and that, that's all we wanted to do was build boards and go surfing. So that's what we did. Can you, can you tell me more about the fin? This fin, Ed, because we were doing our own glassing, so we went over to his place and he showed us how to do it. And he got two pieces of glass, waxed it with paraffin wax, and then you lay the cloth on it and put the color down, squeegee it on, soak it good, and then you put, you put the glass on top of that with weights and it would dry and then you make your second layer with the different color you want and so forth until you have a multi-layer color and then when it all dried out and you'd have a slab like this you'd cut it out and shape it and grind it and foil it and this is how we had our fins and this board here has a hole a puka over here in the back of the fin but this was way before leashes so somebody i guess had put a puka back here then tried to attach a leash or something but when we were growing up you know, the good guys surf, the junk guys swam, and I swam a lot. Surfing sunset at, you know, eight to 10 feet, you'd, you'd swim three or four times and hope your board didn't go out in the rip. Pipeline was a little easier, it was dangerous, but it, the beach was really close, and so we swam all the time. You know, I didn't catch as much waves as all the really good guys, but I caught a few. I was very careful and, you know, scary out there. But guys like Tom Stone really mentored me out there and Stephen Ng because those guys really charge these big waves. Nowadays, compared to the young kids, it's like there's hundreds of kids like that now. But when we were growing up, there was just a, f a handful of good guys that we all looked up to. The kids that are there now are, are, are you know, the, the John Johns and that, that, that generation, you know. And it's even sad to see, you know, Kelly is fading out. He's an exception to the rule, right? Kelly Slater, he's, he's old already, but he's still top shape and still can, you know, he can compete with his grandchildren <laughs> is what he's doing. But, you know, it's amazing. But these young guys are, Jerry Lopez made a prophecy 30 years ago. He says in the future, people are going to be riding waves bigger than you ever imagined, doing things you never thought they would do. And he's right. Look at Kyle, Kyle Lenny, totally dethroned, uh, 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 Laird Hamilton. Yeah. Laird was the king for years, but Kai's the new king. Yeah. And it's okay. I mean, you know, just take it with the, sh you know, fame is fleeting. You cannot be famous forever. So what? That's not the important thing. You know, your most important thing is your family yeah. Ab above anything. And people that can't handle the dethroning or getting less famous, then they have all kinds of problems. Yeah, they, uh, just move on. Yeah, you know? Kai is a Well, I was out at sunset the other day surfing, right? And then when I was just about to go in, I saw somebody on this longboard. It looked like a foamy. It had the same blue color, like the Costco kind foamy. And he was ripping on the nose, skeg first. I go, who's this guy riding this foamy? So I came in, I was watching like that. And I go, oh, it's Kai Lenny. 
And I go, oh, and so when he came in, I was going to go over to him and say, oh, bro, what's your name? I don't know. I never met you before. I was going to do that, but he, he laughed. Because, you know, he's very, he's world famous now. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. but he seems like a nice person. He is. He does seem like, yeah, I follow his YouTube stuff. Yeah, he seems like he's a nice person. He's not, the Hawaiian word for arrogant is ho'okano. And no offense to Lance Ho'okano, but, you know, Ho'okano means that. It means that you're full of it and you're in your cell, you know. And, and there's a lot of people in those circles that are Ho'okano. And it's too bad because fame is fleeting. My uncle Ed Parker was a famous karate teacher. In, uh, he, when he left Hawaii, he went to California. And he started, well, actually went to Utah. Started He, he, he trained here under Professor Chow, so, you know, Kempo Karate. And he went to BYU. And he started teaching the police force up there. Then he went, ended up in California, opened his own studio. One of his students is Chuck Norris. Bruce Lee stayed with him. He was Elvis Presley's bodyguard for seven or eight years, very close to Elvis, and very famous, you know, super famous. But my grandma's story is he'd come over here, and my mom would cook him lunch, you know, and he'd go, yeah, I'm, I was with the king of Arabia, and you know, me and Elvis and Chuck and, you know, Arn oh, whatever. And my grandma goes, Edmund, did you go church Sunday? Edmund, did you pay your tithing? She didn't give a rip. And that's true. It doesn't matter. It's how you treat people. You know, that's the way I look at it. And hopefully, you know, I don't have a bad rap for that. In my younger days, maybe a little darker days, is it's, you know, you, but I was never like some of those crazy guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Titus is a good example of Titus. He calls it his dark years. Crazy on Kauai. I mean, and you know, the Hawaiians have good reason to feel, to have contempt for the Hawaii for what happened to them, you know. But Jesus will judge everyone. Yes, he will. And I always tell everybody, you know, when you go, when you die and Jesus comes to you, you think he's going to come to say, hey, how are you? He's going to say, hey, aloha mai ko mako hale. Hele mai. Aloha mai yao. He's going to talk Hawaiian. He's not going to talk Hawaii. <laughs> they go, that's what I think. Yeah. And you know, and you know when Jesus is going to come? Nobody knows. Nobody knows, but you know what I, when he, when I think he's going to come? He's going to come on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> when you have millions oh, of people who are, who, are, who are disrespecting the Sabbath. Because when my grandma, my mom grew up here in the 20s. When my grandma was born in 1897, Nobody did anything on Sunday to go to church. Everybody went, Protestant, Catholic, everybody. All of Honolulu was shut down. Look at it now. The missionaries came here and told the Hawaiians put clothes on. Look at their, their ancestors now. Their, their children wear less clothes at the beach than, than the Hawaiians. Yeah. And it wasn't bad to the Hawaiians. It was like it's totally upside down. Yeah, yeah. So when Jesus comes again, and I believe he'll come on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> When you have, how many millions of people watch Super Bowl yeah, on TV? It's a, it's a, I think it's a distraction. It's Sunday, though. It, it's the Sabbath. And, you know, I've never surfed on Sunday in my whole life because I, I promised God if I went on a mission, please let me surf the rest of my life. So I can surf six days a week. Why should I go on Sunday? The only time I went in the water on Sunday was to take my, swim my friend's ashes out to this island out here. He passed away in a car accident, and I literally swam his ashes to the island because the boat was too big to anchor. So I jumped off, and we took it to the island. That's the only time I've ever swam in the water on Sunday. I did host the Tahitian paddling crew on the Molokai Hoi, you know, but other than that, I never surf on Sunday. I don't need to. People, oh, you miss out. Sunday was good, man. I go, hey, so? I don't care. It doesn't, doesn't, affect, doesn't bother me. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, you have to go to work on Monday. I'm going to surf. <laughs> awesome. You laugh, you laugh kind of like Eddie Murphy. Oh, really? He's one of my favorite comedians. Yeah. He is one of my... Yeah. I like your stories. They're very, no. very, very good stories. There's a lot of stories. and yeah. You know, I guess I'm old. That's why I have so many stories. <laughs> Ramon wanted me to talk a little bit about the boards that I have here. This is... a. Uh, one of my personal boards, it's a 11.6 board that I don't really surf giant waves anymore or really big, or maybe I never really did because when we were growing up, it was all a relative term. And we all aspired to like in the eight to 12 foot range with maybe 15, 18 feet. Anyways, this is an 11.6 that I made for myself, glassed by Brian King. He's one of the best glassers on the island. This is a 10.3 that I still use a lot at sunset. Um, people let me catch waves out there still. And my 9.6 quad, kind of my go-to for sunset when it's like uh, six to eight feet. 
This is a custom board that I made for some friends of mine, for um, a Laulu family. And so you can see there's like a Maori design on it that they had made. This is for another friend of mine. We just got some boards back from Otis Sharper. He does some of my glassing along with Three Stone, Brian King, Jack Reeves does a few. If I can get my foot in the door. This is a, and these are all custom boards that I made. This is a long board, kind of a pipeliner, classic outline that a lot of people like. And then this is actually for a friend of mine, Paul Lindo, who was surfing Sunset a few weeks ago and broke his neck again. And he's in rehab in Colorado. And we're, we're just doing like a, like a fundraiser board for him. So this is a 70s style board that we're, we, we did. And then this, these other two are for customs for Ulu Kukumitsu. He's a Kalo farmer in Hakipu. And then this is for the, uh, hus the father of this girl's is Tyson La Ulu. So they're all custom boards. Each board is hand shaped. And you know, I'm never, I never got into the computer thing. So every board is one of a kind. Yep. <laughs>